Welcome back to another episode of the Wedding Photo Hangover Podcast, an irreverent look at wedding photography. This week, I'm joined by James Broadbent, the co-founder of Narrative and Chase Wild. James, how are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited. Um, I have been like a technology nerd for a while, um, been like a really uh, avid reader of TechCrunch, probably more so back like in the earlier days when it was like Mike Arrington was still there and MG Siegler was writing for them. And so the idea that I'm now talking to somebody who's been written about <laughs> TechCrunch for their uh, technology startup company is just really kind of cool to me. And I'm, I'm nerding out just a little bit um, over here. So <laughs> oh, awesome. thank I'm, you so much I'm, for coming on our podcast and, uh, you know, it's just it's it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. No, it's 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 exciting to talk to you too. I've been listening to your episodes. So. Oh, why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's it's really cool. Uh, are you in New Zealand right now, or you, you guys yeah, are pretty much yeah. locked down in New Zealand, right? Not at all. Um, New Zealand has been basically COVID-free since um, since March. We had one six-week lockdown, and we've had another two-ish week lockdown and a couple small ones but um we're, we're basically like festivals are happening here like everything's full go festivals so. are happening yeah um, here in america it's... festivals are also happening they're just really unsafe and a lot of people get sick <laughs> afterwards yeah yeah it's it's new zealand is in a very very unique position we've basically you know since since the initial outbreak there was i don't know a couple thousand cases we've We've had less than a hundred community cases since then. Um, we've like we just closed our borders, um, like really strong quarantine. If you wanted to come in and out of the country, and there was like a couple that um, sneak through here and there. But aside from that, like we've been living pretty COVID free here. Um, so yeah, but, but yet still, a lot of wedding photographers have taken a really hard hit because you know people can't come into New Zealand for weddings right now, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff that a lot of wedding photographers are shooting here is international people coming in, um, kind of like Iceland. You know, like it's such a destination location, so it also is New Zealand. Um, yeah, so it's been pretty tough here for the community. So for listeners who don't know, um, aside from Narrative, which is like the technology company that's helping to streamline photographers' workflows, um, you actually started out as a wedding photographer and you run like a destination wedding photography business. Is it fair to call it that, yeah. Chase Wild? Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, with, how did you kind of get started with that? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously Chase Wild um, – is a wedding photography brand that myself and Cameron Thorpe, a good friend of mine, um, launched about five or six, six years ago, something like that. Yes, you can call us a destination wedding photography. I think we've shot with clients in 20, almost 20 different countries now. Um, oh, wow. So, um, yeah, I, I, how did we get into that? So, I, my, I, my story into photography is a little bit unconventional. Um, Sometimes I call myself a, a bit of a product of Instagram in some senses because that was like kind of like something that really like propelled us into photography. But mm -hmm. I mean, in some senses, it started before Instagram. Um, the, a, a long time ago, I, I did a, a trip where I traveled overseas from India to Europe, and I decided like, look, I want to document this trip while I while I do that and um so I went out and I bought a camera and like I had a friend who was a, a, a photographer and I was like what should I buy and he's like you know get a 60 get a full frame and buy a 50 hour lens like it's the best lens you, you can get and I like I had no idea so I bought this like fixed 50 millimeter lens and went traveling for like nine months mm -hmm. um turns out that that's actually a really good way to teach yourself how to like move your feet and find good frames um, because I was like finding myself in these beautiful parts of like Pakistan and going, like, I want to capture those mountains, but like, I can't, like, how, what, what do I need to do? Um, and so I, I was running a Tumblr at the time and yeah, I mean, I talked about Instagram. I, I should have launched it on Instagram, but anyway, <laughs> um, Tumblr was, you know, like pretty, pretty decently big at that time. And um, yeah. And so I just started sharing my, my images to mostly my friends, but that, that Tumblr started to gain a little bit of traction. And um, when I came back to New Zealand, I, I didn't have any work at the time. And I was like, I was like, man, I'm pretty sure I want to get into photography. Like, 
I'm absolutely loving this. Um, and, and someone said to me, Hey, like, I, I saw your blog, like, would you be willing to photograph my wedding? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like I'd, I'd love to, I'd absolutely love to do that. And I, I remember I did have a friend at the time who was a wedding photographer and he's like, look, if you ever do decide to get into wedding photography, don't set your pricing too low. Like you're going to get yourself into this pit of like <laughs> budget weddings and like at the beginning, all of your early bookings come from referrals. And so like, if you charge 500 bucks for your first one, you're not, it's going to be hard to charge much more for the next one. So the, the first wedding I photographed, I said, look, my, I charged $2,000. Um, and I rocked up and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I hired one of those 70 to 200 millimeter um, <laughs> like giant lenses. <laughs> yeah. And I remember like going, oh my gosh, how do I capture anything? Like I've got to go like so far back. And I'm like, yep, just turn that way a little bit. Um, yeah. And, and, and I guess like <clears throat> the photos weren't so bad. And, um, and I, like I posted them online and within – I, I just, I, I still hadn't like worked out what I wanted to do. So I was kind of like just floating around trying to decide. And, and then all of a sudden I started getting new inquiries. Um, mm -hmm. And some of them, it was in the middle of summer here and they were super late inquiries for like next month and that kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, wow. So within, within the first six months, I, I booked and shot six weddings. Um, and so effectively the day that I shot my first wedding was the day I became full-time wedding photographer. <laughs> That's crazy that's that's so fast i think uh my wife and i our first year doing photography i think we booked 15 weddings but most of them were towards the end of that first year <laughs> And yeah. so it was kind of like uh things kind of gradually built up and then like we had a bunch but it was this oh you never expect it like six months six weddings like that's that's real fast wow yeah, well, that was booking and shooting them, and then that I remember that six month that six wedding I shot. It was um it was a winter wedding here in New Zealand in in June, mm -hmm. and so you get to shoot you know through the sunset light for your whole photo shoot because you know it's getting dark at like five or something like that. Um, and these like wild horses turned up while we we're doing the photo shoot, and the bride looked amazing, and it was like all like perfect DIY. Um, and it just got published quite widely here across mm -hmm. like magazines and a bunch of blogs and stuff like that. And so from that June to the following June, I ended up shooting 40 weddings about, um, and so it, it really just completely, took off. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew at the time I was like, I'm not going to be able to sustain this cause I'd already, you know, I'd done six over six months and that was, you know, was obviously was sort of working it out. Um, yeah, and, th and that was sort of like the beginning of, of my, my wedding photography career. And it was during that next summer, Cameron Thorpe, my, my good friend, he was in a similar position to me who was, you know, getting into wedding photography at the same time. And we started shooting with each other. And so basically any opportunity we had, we just shot together. Um, even if they hadn't like booked or paid for a second photographer, we just wanted to work together. Mm -hmm. And we decided, man, this is awesome. Like we, we love this. And the part which we love um, about wedding photography is obviously, you know, shooting, working with your clients, um, producing beautiful work. And the part that we hated was running a website, you know, a blog, <laughs> social media, you know, performance ads, um, all of that other stuff. And we're like, yeah. what, what if we could just like split that stuff in half, but yet still both shoot under the same brand. And so that's what Chase Wild is today. We're two photographers that operate under the same brand. Um, you land on our website. Uh, it's not exactly how we... Yes, we're two different photographers, but um, we're not two different brands that operate underneath mm -hmm. um, Chase Wild. Well, uh, I was looking through like your your photos and stuff, and there was no way I could have told like your photos apart at all. Like they just all look very similar in uh, terms of composition and editing and everything like that. I assume a yeah. lot of that is you guys specifically try to do that since you're trying to keep it yeah. consistent brand wise, but um, you guys yeah. seem to have very similar uh, ideas about like how you shoot and everything like that from the yeah. outside. And I think that's just, it's mostly true. Like it's probably because 
one, when we were learning, we were so influenced by each other. So we'd be like, hey, I just like kind of, you know, worked out this way that you can shoot like your s- subject with like this kind of lens and capture the background in this way. Or like, oh, have you tried using the light in this way? And so we kind of just amalgamated our styles. And then when it came to, you know, creating our, our look and our feel in terms of our editing, um, it was really difficult at the time, but we worked out how to like connect our presets across Lightroom using, um, um, what are they called? Some symbiotic links or something like that. Anyway, so we had Mm -hmm. them like, so that one person created a preset was instantly appearing on the other person's computer. And we were just like trying different stuff and being like, I created a new preset, try that. Um, and we were like each sort of just elevating our style and, and converging it. And, and so that's kind of how we managed to do that. (laughs) As the person yeah. in, in my business who's trained to manage three separate computers and keep all the presets the same, <laughs> I would kill for something where you just change a preset or create a preset on one and it just syncs to the other two. Yeah. That's yeah. so smart. I, I, I think if you just, like, we were we just had the preset, because you, obviously you can't put them in a Dropbox folder. They have to be in a specific mm-hmm. folder on your computer, but you can create a sim link to a Dropbox folder. And so it... Like the Dropbox folder thinks that it's that folder, or I can't remember exactly how it works, and so then it inadvertently syncs um, via Dropbox. That's so smart! Wow, that might be the best tidbit of information I've ever gotten in an interview before. This is going to change how I run my business. <laughs> it's going to save I mean, me so much time. You know, it's so funny because I've been starting to use Lightroom um, CC a whole lot more, um, mm-hmm. just because I want to obviously like. There's a lot more happening there. Um, I, I think it's kind of reached the point where you can actually use it in terms of like it's got every, basically everything, not everything that that classic mm-hmm. has, um, and that also solves that same problem, right? Because it syncs all of your presets as well. So it's kind of it's kind of an old problem. I think I wouldn't be surprised that if in a year most people are starting to port over to CC. What do you see as the advantage of CC over classic, other than? I mean, preset thinking. Yeah, but th- that's it's where they're going to start to bring out a bunch of their um, mm-hmm. like image analysis stuff. Um, and I think also, man, I just love being able to pick up my phone and like continue what I was doing. So if I mm-hmm. if I do a, like a real a real quick shoot, um, uh, like the, the other the other day, I was. Um, it was my my partner's sister's graduation, and I was like, "I'll take a few photos," but you know, like the whole process of editing and then exporting and then uploading and then creating a link and sharing that, like that that still takes longer than it should. But with CC, you can just like throw them in. Um, you can, if you want, do the selection on your phone. You can do the editing on your phone if you want as well. But the thing which I find really helpful for those kinds of shoots is you can just like once you've made a selection, you can say create a link of these images and straight away like you can with dropbox you've got a url mm-hmm. you can share it with them and they can view and download them um well, so awesome. it's like real handy for those like quick little jobs like that as well yeah yeah that's awesome so um outside of like uh you and cameron right working together yeah. with chase wild yeah. uh yeah do you guys um I think I remember from another interview you did that you guys did, uh, you guys had like another brand that you like trained photographers to shoot for you and stuff. Is that still going on too? During Um, the pandemic? (laughs) Yeah. So we reached this point where we were, um, we had about a thousand inquiries coming in a year to Chase Wild. Wow. And Mm -hmm. we were turning away. Like we, we just kept putting our prices up, 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 up. And people just kept booking them. And like, we were like, this is crazy. Like, what do we do? We're turning away so many people who were just out of the price range for like people don't want to spend, you know, seven, eight grand on a wedding or something like that. And, and so we were like, well, and we were, we were just like giving them to, to anyone and no one kind of, um, most of the times Mm -hmm. it was friends of ours and so forth, but we were like, well, like we're doing so much work to, to build this brand and, and to, um, you know, generate these leads, like maybe we should try and find a way to, to actually like generate some revenue from that as well. And we explored a bunch of ideas like, oh, what if like people paid us commission for referrals or what if, um, I don't know, like, 
you know, like we cre- created like a crediting system where if like someone got us a booking, then like we would expect them to do the same or something like that. But actually what we ended on and landed on the end was um, what if we just created a, a more budget wedding brand, which um, we could refer. Um, and we called it the Isles and we trained up loads of photographers uh, by loads. I mean, like two or three. Um who are able to come along and photograph those weddings. Cause obviously the, the limitation as a wedding photographer is um, how many weddings can you actually physically be at each year? Mm. And then there's, you know, this time constraint of how many weddings can you like edit and so forth. But um, we were using an editor and then like we had trained an in-house editor at the time who, who worked from our office as well. So that wasn't a restriction. It was just physically like, like we couldn't be in two places at the same time. Um, yeah. So, so, <sighs> essentially we like we would pay them a flat cost to turn up and photograph the wedding and then we would have mm-hmm. them edited with a very similar look and feel um as as chase wild stuff and so when people come to us came to us we could just say hey like we're not available but um check out the aisles yeah well that's super smart is that um you said that like festivals and stuff are still going on in new zealand but weddings are those still going on as well or and <laughs> they are but <laughs> Yeah, it's tricky because I, I, I'm, in New Zealand, I feel like everyone know has like someone who's they're really close to who lives overseas. If it's a family member or like you know one of their best friends, and it's really hard for people to come back to New Zealand right now. So most mm-hmm. weddings are not going ahead. There, there are some. Um, I'd say probably half as many as usual. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's rough. So, and obviously, you can't do destination weddings outside of New Zealand this last year since no going in and out. So, has that led you to focus more of your time on your other business, on narrative? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm completely full time on narrative now. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, my my whole week nine to five is spent in narrative office with my team there. I, I like I'm I'm still keen to shoot as much as I can. I'm uh, like my goal has been to shoot five five bookings a year. Um, nice, just because it's like I absolutely love doing it, and it's really important for me to continue to keep my finger on the pulse in terms of just like what it's actually like. Like we we build software for photographers, but like it doesn't it doesn't make sense for me to not be frequently using that as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so so. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, nowhere near as 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 full time in Chase Wild as as I originally was, mm-hmm. and and Cam still, um, it, Cam still runs the Chase Wild brand, and oh, cool. um, he s- continues to float between so float between Europe and New Zealand, which was something that we were doing for for quite a long time, which was basically um, we would travel up to Europe for like two, three, four months each year and try and shoot as many weddings as we could um over that time i mean and this is like when we were in our 20s and we just had no responsibility at all and so we could just bugger yeah. off for, for three months and it didn't matter <laughs> um it, conveniently my mum lives in london and so i would like fly into london and like drop a massive suitcase and then like fly out to italy and then like shoot a wedding and then either like move to the next destination or fly back um hang out my mum for a little bit more and then like you know off to Iceland or off to the Faroe Islands or whatever um yeah so we we ended up we've spent heaps of time shooting around in Europe and it's it's I miss it so much (laughs) yeah do you get to travel as much with the narrative during non-pandemic years as you used to travel with uh with Chase Wild nah nowhere near nowhere near as much um yeah I mean there's been like the occasional wedding which is which is taking me overseas but yeah nowhere near as much I think like um I'd absolutely love to and like I'd love to be involved in more workshops that are overseas because obviously we've run um loads of workshops here in New Zealand and Mm -hmm. you know like um uh conferences and so forth like I've um I spoke at workshop the conference in New York which is run by Forge North and and similar and Mm -hmm. so like those opportunities that I I'm, I'm sort of jump at where, where possible. Oh, that's awesome. So, um, sorry, just one moment. Ian, what? I'm so sorry about that. My son's no, calling okay. for me from upstairs. He's doing a virtual school, so he's, like, doing all of his schoolwork and stuff from home. But 
it's, uh, it's been a year. <laughs> I can it's imagine. Been a year. <laughs> I have a five-year-old daughter as well. She's. I'm trying to get her ready for kindergarten. I was like, just play on your iPad for like the next hour, please. <laughs> oh. So, you, uh, so she's actually going to like physically to kindergarten at the moment. No, she'll start in August, which um, uh, okay. we should be good by the time August comes around. Uh, they just said that we'd have like all, we'd have enough um, vaccines for everybody in the U.S. by the end of May. So mm-hmm. like come June, theoretically, as long as people actually get vaccinated, our country should be like back to normal almost. So, mm. <sighs> So it's not really that much different from normal right now. People just, we, we were at a, oh gosh, we went to like an ice cream shop the other day, my wife's like hometown and like we roll up all in masks and like only one person gets out of the car to go up and order. They come back to the car, wait for the order to be up, go back and get it. And like all the people in the hometown are just like mask off, standing around, like talking to each other. They're like coming up to each other and talking. And it's just like, this is how like the virus has gotten so out of control in the U S it's like, can you guys Mm -hmm. please just put on your mask and like try not to like talk five inches from each other's faces. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. uh, And quite the year, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. Yeah. For a lot of people, like, I mean, wedding photography industry, absolutely, and and so many so many people outside of that. Mm. Yeah. So back to what we were talking about before that <laughs> interruption. Um, how? Uh, so how did you? How did you get to the point where you decided um, just shooting weddings maybe wasn't fulfilling enough and you wanted to figure out like how to help streamline things for photographers because you started mm. out with narrative publish. Um, and that was the first product that you guys put out. And I'm just kind of curious, like what, what helped you make the move from photography over to the uh, software side of things? Yeah, it's quite funny. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for those who don't know what publish is, um, publish helps solve that problem of making long form photo blog posts. So if you make a blog post with more than 20 images in it, uh, it's an absolute headache. It takes you ages. I used to spend like half a day building a blog post. Um, if you're trying to put images side by side or creating nice layouts, it gets even more challenging. Um, and I was like, look, like how many photographers face this problem? Like thousands, right? And like, what if we had something which could just allow us to just quickly drag and drop, um, create the layout we wanted, um, do, nail out your CEO, like, um, and then just publish that directly to our website. What if I could do it offline when I was on an airplane? Man, that would be awesome. And so I, I actually emailed a bunch of um, software companies that operate in the photography space. And I was like, hey, like, have you guys thought about this problem? Like, there's a bunch of us that have a massive pain point here. And I think there's a really valuable option, um, a, a valuable product that could be created. And um you know, they all meet, they they all email back and they're like, this is such a great idea. Like, you know, we're really busy right now, but, you know, maybe in like next year or the, the year after. And then some of them were just like, oh, cool. Like, thanks for the idea. And I was like, huh, <laughs> no one's going to build this. Like, no one has the time to build this. Like, maybe, maybe I should just, just do it. Um, so I started exploring options of like, well, how do you, you know, I actually didn't know anything about software at the time. Well, aside from uh, probably similar to you, right? Like tech crunch reader, someone who's like super <laughs> interested in, in, in what's coming out, what's next. Um, and so started speaking to people, as many people as I possibly could to work out like, well, what would this cost? How would we do it? Um, you know, all those kinds of, pr- kinds of problems. Now, it, conveniently, um, my flatmate, is a software engineer and a very good one. And he was very helpful through that process. And I reached a point where I was like, look, I'm going to do it. I'm going to commission someone to do it and we're going to build this product. And he was like, well, hold on. <laughs> what about me? Like, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. So that was the beginning of, um, of publish. And like from actually when we first launched, it was just the two of us. Um, which is an absolute miracle that we we managed to build a product <laughs> with two people. Narrative is now 25 employees, so we've grown to a, a much larger um, company since then. And, uh, you know, like 
we um we weren't really sure like how it was going to be received. We were like, look, you know, if we can sign up, you know, 500 people in the first couple of years, that will be great. Um, you know, we'll make some of our money back and I'll have a product which I really wanted and that, you know, it'd be awesome. And within the first like month, we had like a thousand people sign up and we were like, Oh, okay. <laughs> there's like, there's, there's, this is a real thing. Um, and the more we talked to photographers, they were like, what about this? What about this? Like, um, and so it, it was at that point that we decided, look, like, let's get serious about building tools for professional photographers. Cause no one really takes a professional photographer that seriously. Um, mm -hmm. what are my biggest pain points? always was like the excruciating pain of trawling through like three to five thousand images after a photo shoot and trying to make your selection your cull um and i was like look like if we want to build something which will be big in the professional photography space it's got to be a photo selection tool um and it's got to be something which starts to leverage all the amazing stuff that's happening with ai and machine learning currently um and so that's that's what we decided to to tackle. So obviously we've recently launched the beta of um, Select, which is our our AI powered photo selection tool. Um, Select, you know, not only is it a product which is just really nice to use, it's it's fast, it's clean, it's intuitive, but it has a bunch of AI features which help you just like um, find your best images quickly. So. If people are blinking, if they're squinting, um, it gives you warning indicators under their face just to say, like, you know, like that person is has their eyes closed. Um, mm -hmm. If they're out of focus, it gives you indicators to show you, like, how in focus their faces are. Um, and then one of the features called Distill basically just removes all of the worst images from, from, um, from your photo shoot. So it will remove, like... 10 to 30% of the shoot, depending on, on how strong you, you want that to be, how aggressive you want it to be. And it evaluates all the images, obviously based on eyes focus, um, expression data, understands key subjects within the image and so forth. And so it starts to remove the worst images so that you don't need to just see all that rubbish. And so you're just looking at the good stuff. So we, um, we run surveys to the, our current beta users and mm -hmm. Uh, our users are currently reporting 40% time saved um, when using select, which is crazy. Like I never thought that people would be saving that much time this early on in the product. And so, yeah. Am I supposed to be filling those surveys out? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad at that kind of stuff. Uh, when I first started What's using your, select, wait, what? I was going to say, how much time do you reckon you save using Select? Oh, my gosh. Um, when I first started using it, it was back in August or September when you guys first like sent it out. And I was just like, I yeah. got to test this thing out. I just got to see what it's like because this is something that would save me so much time and I l would love it. And I just remember like using it and I was like, I feel like I'm just like rendering all of my photos in Select and then I have to render them again in Lightroom after I've gone mm. through and cold them. And I've at first, honestly, didn't feel like it was saving me that much time. More recently, mm. uh, especially as this last like six months, Lightroom has just gotten so incredibly slow. And now it's just like mm. Select is so snappy and so fast by comparison. It's like I can just cold air. Yeah. I can send everything over to my Lightroom. And um, I can just, you know, I can just rate like the photos that I want to keep. So I can I can choose to just send over just the photos I had rated or I can choose to send over all the photos. And it's just like, oh, it used to take me like two hours to call a wedding in Lightroom. That's like 6,000 images. I would just like rock it through it, put on some podcasts. Mm -hmm. Then like this last year, it was getting to the point where it was taking me 10, 12 hours to get through it. And now it's back down to like two hours or less. And it has been amazing to uh, <laughs> amazing. specifically group shots. That feature, like from the very beginning, mm -hmm. when I saw that, I was just like, this is going to be like a huge game changer because you guys just pop up everybody's face, a close up. And I can't tell you how many times in Lightroom I am just like pressing space bar, scrolling like around, trying to get to like everybody's face, make sure nobody's blinking. And this is like, it just pops up and it shows me or, uh, <laughs> if I don't want to actually like look at it that hard, it just shows underneath their like face, like the, the little bar where it's like red to green or whatever. And 
gosh, it's just, it is so, it's group photos. The, the time speed up on like culling through group <laughs> photos is like maybe 90% faster. Like that part is just ridiculously yeah. speedy. Now I love it. <laughs> I just, oh gosh. And I mean, you guys didn't have distill when it first launched, right? Cause I, Correct. I don't remember that yeah. until like more recently. And like that just, mm. it's starting out like 10 to 15% of my photos. And I remember like mm. when I first started using it, somebody was like, but would you trust an AI to throw out photos of yours? And I was just like, yes, yes, I would. <laughs> That's all I could think. <laughs> and, like I've done like a few comparisons, like just kind of going back through and I'm just like, yeah, every single photo it throws out is a photo I would throw out. Like I'm just, I'm not a photographer who's yeah. like, I'm going to leave in a, a blurry photo because it looked artsy or it spoke to me or whatever. Mm. I'm like, if I'm delivering it to a client, it's got to be in focus. It's got to be sharp and it's got to be good. And so, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of nerding out right now, but yeah, I'm very, very impressed with uh, <laughs> narrative select. It's so good. Yeah. I mean, that question of trust is obviously super important to the, to how we've built the product, right? Because, you know, like we could try and make a guess as to what you think would be best, but like, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to do that with confidence and you're going to try and you're going to be like, nah, it's not that actually that useful because I've still got to look through the rest of the images to actually find the best shots. So what we can say with a really high confidence is like what is rubbish um, and, and, and just reduce the number of images that you need to, to look at. And, you know, slowly as the product gets smarter and smarter, we'll be able to increase how many images we're rejecting from your photo shoot to save you more and more time in turn. And, and that's why, like, you know, when you're in the product, like, we just need, we, it, it, it's so, it's so nice to use. It's so clean. It's so simple and it's so snappy fast. That's basically been, you know, you've talked about using it for the last six months, speed has just been basically all of our focus. Like if you click any button instantly, whatever it is that you clicked on needs to be there. Um, mm -hmm. Especially obviously we're navigating through images. So um, that's sort of been, been our starting point. And that's because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to save you time. We're trying to move, remove a massive pain point. Um, and now that we're at a point where it's like whizzing, there's going to be a lot that we'll be bringing next in terms of um, new features. So we're keen to hear, like, if you're a user of Narrative, um, if you sign up and try it, <clears throat> there's a little send feedback button in the right-hand corner. Like, we are all open ears to whatever it is, which you'd love to see, um, and, and throw us your ideas. So right now, Narrative Select is still in beta. Um, mm -hmm. how, how much longer do you think it'll be before um, it's ready to come out of beta? Yeah, um, soon, very soon. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, obviously the purpose of keeping it in beta is so that people understand that um, beta software is not perfect. Um, when you're building software, you need people to start using it as early as you can so that you can start to get feedback. And as you've said yourself, like the difference between the beginning of the beta and, and the recent beta is like two different products and basically is like pretty much everything's been ripped out and changed in that time. Um, and yeah like very soon we'll be moving to a point where we move to general availability, which means that anyone can, can use that product. You can actually just jump onto the website now, sign up and, and try it for free. Um, so if you're listening to the podcast right now and you're at your computer and you're like, what is this thing? Like jump on narrative.so and you can, you can have a little bit of a play with it. Mm -hmm. And I'll include a link for that for everybody listening. So they can just tap right on over. Um, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend trying it out. Like, even if you don't think you would want like something like this in your life, the technology is really cool. <laughs> and if I could nerd out for a second again, like it's just really cool to like see the way you guys have built things and the way like you really get to feel that even before it went to beta, there were real photographers who had like an eye on this, who knew like what you're looking for when you're trying to call and people really thought this out and they thought about the design and like how to make a program where you could quickly go through like things and just figure out what's good, what's bad, what's working. And just so, so many parts of it just um, really struck me as things that's like, why, why hasn't, you know, a Lightroom done something like this? Why hasn't, uh, you know, a photo mechanic or all these like other calling things like where, where have they been? 
<laughs> like, like you guys are just coming out of nowhere. It feels like building this awesome product, and it just feels like um, you're way ahead of the game mm -hmm. when it comes to calling and just anticipating what photographers need instead of just like waiting for them to get fed up and I I don't know quit Lightroom or quit quit whatever they use because that's that's where I'm getting to. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was thinking about what you just said in terms of like you may not realize you need this. But I think actually that's that's there's so many photographers out there who because <clears throat> I think the thing that's interesting about photographers in general and like myself included is generally you're not great commercially, which means, you know, like making those business decisions as to like well, what should my pricing be and like what's my time worth or like how much money do I need to make each year to actually sustain a lifestyle and based on that, how much should I be charging? And like, um, you know, if I could change, save five hours a week, what would that be worth to me financially? Like all of those kinds of questions. Like we, we often don't think that way. Like we're, we're creatives and, um, and you know, like if you're saving, you said you're literally saving like 10 hours from like 12 hours in, in Lightroom to a couple mm -hmm. hours and, and select like that's crazy what like if you work out what that's worth to you financially that's so much um and so especially during the peak of wedding season when you have like six yeah. seven weddings a month like just oh it's saving so much time yeah yeah and so i mean and and that's really what we focused on at the beginning of chase wild which helped us um, you know, drive a thousand inquiries each year. Like that doesn't just happen, and that, that doesn't just happen from taking good photos. Like you can, I've seen loads of people who are phenomenal photographers, but um, you know, they, they they might not be charging the most, and they might not be getting the most inquiries because a huge part of running a successful photography brand is creating the brand and getting yourself out there, and you do need to dedicate a lot of time um, to do that. So, you know if you're spending more than half of your week um, selecting, editing, delivering, like doing that, like the actual delivery piece of work, then you're probably spending too much time on that. Mm -hmm. How long until uh, narrative select just adds in all the editing stuff that I need, but it does it all with AI so I don't have to touch <laughs> it and then uh, just integrates with narrative publish. So it, you know, edits the photos, builds a blog post for me with like the 20 best or whatever. And then I just hit a button and now it's published everything for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you heard me talk about Lightroom in the beginning. Like I think Lightroom's an awesome product. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of people out there who are trying to um, use AI to to work out how to edit photos. It's it's quite a creative part of the process, and I think mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting because you're you know like I talked about at the beginning about like how presets and how they're always changing, and and I think that actually is a part of being a really successful photographer is continuing continuing to progress your style. Um, you know, like the most successful musicians, like who have been successful over decades do so by continuing to adapt and change their style and move it forward. So I don't know, having it like do that automatically <laughs> would, would be a bit of a block on that. I think. I do know it was a huge change for me just in how well I was shooting when, uh, in our company, my wife originally was the person who called all the photos and then we switched over to me calling all the photos and just being able to see what wasn't working helped me get so much better in a much shorter period of time than like before that. Like it just, uh, it just felt like I could instantly look at my photos, see what was wrong. And then I I could not make the same mistake the next time. <laughs> yeah. So I get what you're saying about needing to like keep your, your eye on that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, James, do you want to answer some weird questions from Facebook with me? <laughs> okay. Um, have, was I meant to have seen these beforehand or are they meant to be a bit of a surprise? Nah, they're just, uh, they're, they're meant to be more of a surprise. <laughs> Let's do some Q and A. But, but Steve. Okay, the first on. one comes from Gowering Bat from, uh, the wedding photo hangover Facebook group. And he asks, um, he had seen online that narrative select was Apple only. And he was just wondering if you guys were working on a release for PCs. Yeah. Yeah, PC will come. Um, you know, I, I was saying 
the whole part of beta is to, to perfect the product. Um, perfecting two products at the same time is slightly more challenging than, um, than mm -hmm. one. Um, so it's obviously a, a, a strategic move for us to just focus on, on Mac, but um, PC will come quite soon. Like it's all built off technology that easily transfers over to, um, to PC. It just so happens that like most of most photographers use Mac. And so we've yeah. had people say to us quite often, like, man, I went out and bought a Mac because <laughs> I just wanted to use. <laughs> I love it. I just wanted to use Select. Um, and so, and man, if you're on, what are you doing if you're on a PC? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it has to get even harder because, like, right now with Mac going through the transition from the um, from Intel to their own their M1, M1. chips, now it's like. Are you guys like, have you guys already done like a bunch of work rewriting stuff or is that something you're planning for the future or? Um, in the lab, in the sense that like not, it's not yet in production, but we, I'm just trying to remember the exact figures. Um, it's about four times faster on the M1 than it is wow. on like, you just, a cl your classic um, off the shelf Mac currently like Intel. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting for us because some of the stuff which we're doing is pretty grunty. Because you, you'll notice, like, when you when you start ingesting images into Select, like, it starts firing them through and processing them. Um, and you hear your um, your fan spin up for a little while, while while it does that. So the faster we can do that, like, M1's going to be amazing for the um, photography community. Yeah. Yeah, I heard... Uh... Photoshop just got an update to make it compatible with the or M1 native, and uh, I've watched a few videos of people loading Photoshop, just opening it up, and it's like, oh, that's that's like ten times faster than Photoshop mm. opens mm. on my computer, mm. and I just think yeah. like, I'm I'm saving like what ten seconds every single time I go to open Photoshop. Then like that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it, for us, it's just about working out the right time into to getting that into the products. Basically, no one has M1 <laughs> right now. Yeah, you know, like it's like less than one percent of 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 people. So, yeah, I know a lot of people are waiting for the uh, like iMacs and like the more powerful computers to uh, make the switch, and like a MacBook Pro that has a fifteen inch screen and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. hopefully, this year when that stuff rolls out. <laughs> We started to see more yeah. of a transition, and I'm able yeah. to make a transition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a 15 inch MacBook Pro user as well. It'd be hard to to, to drop to a to a 13, mostly just because sometimes you do want to edit images on the go, and it, and it's it's hard doing that on a 13 inch. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh Withers from our Facebook group says that uh, he's having trouble with the concept of needing to have like a narrative publish membership staying like current in order for his old content to stay alive. And then he also said that that's not his question though. His question is what's your favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can address that however you want. <laughs> so in regards to the first piece, like there's a few things to keep in mind with publish like um the way in which we've built this uh, y your content via publish is delivered via there's like we use a hundred different cdns worldwide to deliver that content that's on your website so when it when it when it loads that publish post on that website via these cdns it's like fires that content at that person whoever it is wherever in the world as quickly as possible and what is Google care about more than anything um, when it comes, not more than anything, but a massive factor is actually how fast mm -hmm. those, those pages are. And if you've got like, you know, it's, I think the average number of images in a narrative blog post is like 70. If you've got 70 images on a page, Google penalizes you real hard because it's just a real slow load time. Um, and so one, like, we, we talk about how, you know, narrative is great, pub, sorry, publish is great because it helps you like create beautiful layouts and like it simplifies the process and you can do it offline and all that stuff. But like it's here to also help you get an epic SEO. Um, and and so we, we, we're doing so much in the background to ensure that's the case. Like we're, we're, we're resizing each of those images into five different image sizes so that regardless of whatever 
device it is that the person who visits that page lands on it, um, they get the the correct image size so that it loads as quickly as possible. Um, it does a bunch of smart loading where like it's not it's it's not loading all of the images on the page as you scroll. It starts to load them um, and it's loading like mm-hmm. the length of two screens off your page. So as you and you never you you would never know, but. Um, um, and so there's heaps going on in the background and a lot of people don't actually know this, but if you decide at any point, um, you're like, Oh, I've got all these posts published with narrative, but you know, I just, um, you know, I don't know, like I'm, I'm going through COVID and like, I'm not publishing anything right now, but I need the content to stay online, but I don't want to like actively keep adding content. You can park your plan. Um, 10 bucks a year, you can park your plan with narrative. We keep all your posts live. You can do that for as long as you want. Um, and so it's amazing. I had no idea that you could do that with narrative. I knew that you guys had a function so you could, uh, export blog posts and stuff. Yeah. For people who are thinking about leaving or just people who are worried about having to keep paying in the subscription, but that's a really cool feature that they can pay 10 bucks a year to park it. Yeah, totally. So you won't be able to sign and publish new plans, new posts, um, but everything stays live. Oh, that's really cool. So then what what was your favorite color though? Um, good question. I, <laughs> I feel like I've got like 10 jackets that are in this color. So it probably needs to be this. Um, and every time I'm at the shop with my girlfriend, she's like, I'm like, what about this? She's like, James, khaki green. <laughs> no more. <laughs> so it's probably that (laughs) i love that color i think it's great (laughs) yeah no that's a great choice uh deandra from a random facebook group asks can someone explain why so many photographers waste so much time culling photos i shoot 100 photos i deliver 100 photos what's the problem (laughs) is that a joke (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> someone's trolling right it's gotta be a troll <laughs> what who shoots 100 photos and delivers 100 photos how many photos do you take of the floor when you're shooting like I take 100 <laughs> photos of the floor <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, like, I, so I'm many accidentally times. taking photos when I'm in the toilet like I've got my cameras hanging off me like <laughs> I'm not <laughs> maybe oh. maybe maybe if you were a film photographer you could shoot 100 photos um I'm guessing that uh, yeah <laughs> now I'm just thinking to myself where is the Chase Wild gallery of uh images that is just the restaurant floors <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Do you guys want to check out all the restroom floors at a different venue scheme yeah. shot at last year? We have it built right for you. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah. gosh. Um, Cassie from a random Facebook group asks, I do 30 family photos of each family grouping at weddings. I put my camera on burst mode and just blast a few bursts. It's a lot to process, though, in the studio. Um, does anybody know what I could do to speed this up without taking less photos? Those all caps at the end. Sorry. I wasn't yelling at you. Nah, it's so funny um, that she mentions that because that was also sort of one of the realizations for me that, you know, well, actually, no, let me rewind a little bit. When I first started shooting, I remember I was taking like, I don't know, 2,000 photos at, at a wedding. And I remember coming home and being like, this is so much. This is such a burden. And I had the, one of my friends who was like, previous person who takes 100 photos and takes 100 and delivers 100 was like you know you've just got to be more careful about what you shoot like just like be more accurate and like find your frame and like just just hold back and I tried that for a while and then I realized I was just missing so many moments because like I mean we're we're photographers of people and like you can't control what your subject does like people they blink they move they talk they never really do what you expect and so I actually went the other way um Mm-hmm. And, and, what, and, and, and so, you know, just like this person who shoots 30, 30 photos at a, a group family shot, I realized, like, if I want to nail um, uh, my shoot, I, I actually need to, to shoot as much as I can. Um, so I'm not, I'm not shooting at high speed um, for family, uh, for, for any photos. But I, 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 my 
average number of images shot is probably closer to like 5,000 now. Um, and I never miss them. I never find myself in a situation where I'm like, Oh, that was such a great moment. But like, it's, it's a shame that like her eyes like this or something like that. <laughs> um, and so I will, I'd really encourage everyone to start to shoot maybe not 30 for, well, I don't know. It depends how many people are in that, in that group shot, but like shoot a bit more and you'll find yourself going less like, Oh man, that was so good. But like, they don't look so great. I mean, the other thing that our clients say to us all the time is like, man, people just look so good and so comfortable um, in, in your images. And a big part of that is like how we work with that client. But it's also because we've just got lots more options to, to choose from when we're doing that photo selection. So like we get our subjects moving heaps, we get them walking, we get them like talking and all of that kind of stuff. And and those are the shots where it's like easy to miss. Um, and so you need you need um, you need you need large scenes or groups of images of, of similar shots to to find your best. So the I mean I think the answer is kind of obvious. There's a product called Narrative Select, um, and <laughs> <laughs> it has a bunch of features which help you filter through um, groups of images. So you know you could um, run to still, and it could remove ten to thirty percent of that scene. Um, and oh, and actually, I didn't even talk about scenes. Like that's actually how distill works. It, it it like breaks up your photo shoot, um, not physically, but it understands like this is these images live together, these images live together, um, and it's removing the worst from each scene. It's not just going like these are objectively like bad images. It's only like so if there's only like one or two images from a scene, it's not going to remove e either of them because you know you might need both of them it's only for those like large scenes so if there's 30 30 images um in that scene and you've got it set to the highest strength then it's going to remove at least the worst 10 um and then for the others you're going to see warning indicators for like faces that um uh have out of focus people who are blinking and then you can bring up that close-ups panel on the on the right hand side and just see like a full crop of every single face there That's awesome. Uh, one last question. Robin from a random Facebook group asks, um, what is the thing you waste the most time on as a photographer? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny because it's like, well, that's, that's kind of what we've been talking about today, which is, yeah. um, I mean, that's why we built the products, which we have. It's because there are things which consume like so much time. So let's throw um, blogging and calling out. What's the next yeah. thing yeah. that narrative select is gonna or narrative is gonna tackle? <laughs> Without giving away um, any uh, tips about future products, what's the next <laughs> thing that takes the most time? Um, <laughs> responding to Instagram comments? No. <laughs> can we can we have a bot for that? <laughs> um, no, nah, I mean. I think I also touched on this earlier, which is like, I think that, um, you know, and a waste of time isn't the right language, but if you're spending more than half of your time on like fundamental pieces of like delivering the product to the client, which is the edited images, then you're spending too much time. You need to be spending more time actually building your brand, um, mm -hmm. which involves like, getting your content out there in every and any way that you can, um, working on your blog, um, tightening the screws on your Instagram, your Facebook, maybe you're doing, a, I don't know, a TikTok or like getting involved in Clubhouse or something like that. Um, and like that's that's really how you take your brand to the next level. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's how you get to a scale where you're getting a thousand inquiries a year. Brand-wise for narrative, other than going on a lot of podcasts, uh, where, where are you guys focusing, like social media and stuff like that? What do you guys see as being like the best places for your, your ideal clients? Like where, where are they hanging out? Yeah. Um, I mean, at this stage, we're growing super organically. Like if you follow our Instagram, you'll see – every day people are just talking about our products because they they love it and that's the best way for us to continue continue to grow at this stage um mm -hmm. just while we're early stage and while while we're perfecting things you know like someone jumps on and creates an like an instagram story of of 
you know, select and they're like, man, look at this program. It's so awesome. It's fast. It has face assessments. It's close up panel. It has this thing called distill. And they just like tell, like they educate the, the potential user on like all of our um, key features. It's like, it's the best way for us to continue to, to grow right now. Um, yeah. And that's like, that's, that's where photographers hang out, social, um, um, Facebook groups, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So have you guys been doing anything like this past year to help photographers out during the, uh, during the pandemic with stuff? I know you mentioned earlier the whole thing where you could park like their, um, their blog for $10 a year and stuff. Have you guys had to innovate any other like stuff like that? Well, you know, um, when, when the first lockdowns first hit, like we realized this is going to be real hard for photographers. And so we, we, I can't remember what the period was now, but we just said like, look, like you don't have to pay <laughs> for the next, I think it was month or two or something like that. Um, because like, I'm a photographer, like I was sitting there going, guys, like imagine how everyone's feeling right now. They're losing all of their bookings. Like, anything we can do to help photographers worldwide Mm -hmm. um, is going to be so valued. Um, Yeah. So I think that that's like a really important um, piece. And this is kind of like a reverse way of answering the question as well, but like, I don't know about in America, but in New Zealand, a lot of photographers are talking about like the double, the double season that's approaching. Mm -hmm. Like there's all these weddings that are being postponed um, and now there's all these new people are getting engaged and they're about to like set dates. Um, and so all of a sudden, like people are booking weddings on like Wednesdays <laughs> and it's like, when did you ever have like Wednesday bookings? Um, and so you're going to have like twice as much, potentially twice as much work, um, this next summer. Well, I guess you guys are about to come into the summer it's Mm -hmm. kind of maybe bad timing for you guys but um you know like select should help you through that time um, which is (laughs) and publish will will... help you through the time where you're trying to get all those blog posts up after that time (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) i love it i know that's not what you're expecting me to say but like it's true like that's what we're here for well you guys also do workshops in New Zealand and stuff, right? Are you guys uh planning to bring like workshops and everything back uh once the pandemic is kind of Yeah, over? so um yeah, Chase Wild um Cam and I have run many workshops actually. We've had like hundreds of people come through our workshops here in New Zealand. And yes, there are hundreds of people here. Um <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> We, I actually kind of think we hit the ceiling a little bit in some senses where it was just like, uh, who, like who, who else wants to come through? And it's like, well, everyone's come through now. Um, and so like, we do still run them actually. Like we had one, oh, I think it was maybe, oh, it was in the middle. It was, it was like three or four months ago or something like that. Um, and so mm-hmm. yeah, we'll continue to do them. Um, where where people with where there's the need i guess yeah awesome well james thanks so much for coming on the podcast and chatting with me today um if listeners want to find more about you or more about narrative uh where do they find that stuff online yeah totally um so what if you want to follow me on on instagram um just search james broadbent um if you if you want to follow chase wild it's just chase wild photos um if you want to follow follow narrative on instagram narrative app um it's probably the easiest way um chase wild is just chasewild.com narrative.so is the website for for narrative if you want want to check that out awesome and uh people people can sign up for select beta now um how are you guys letting a lot of new people into that or yeah. is the are the numbers yeah. kind of a if you request access um like if you sign up you'll go straight into the product now um we we had a we had a um, bit of a queue initially because we were just trying to um gate entry um so that we weren't over <laughs> like had our service sort of overrun by thousands of people um but yeah jump on you'll be able to try it out straight away have a play hopefully you've got some photos um that you can that you can put through it put make sure you put through if you're like just trying it um make sure you put through like an actual photo shoot not like selected 
or delivered images because it kind of defeats the point of the purpose like we're trying to we're gr grouping your scenes of images and, and so forth um so you need like selected and un unselected images in there and, and have a play and let us know what you think like we're actively working on this um pushing updates super frequently right now um so we want to hear what you guys think awesome well thanks so much james and i'll let you go and get back to your day in new zealand cheers thanks cheers see ya Wedding Photo Hangover was edited this week by Steve Van Alp.